Well, good day and welcome to Time in the Word with RHCC. And it's my privilege to be here sharing with you today. It's been a while for me and uh, I've had a few things that are on the go, but I don't know if you know, um, this past fall, I've actually been uh, kind of jumping in with uh, courses. And so I've had a couple of courses that I've been taking, university courses, and uh, those are done. And so Tim has been taking more of the bulk of the preaching during that time uh, because I've had uh, just a lot of assignments and stuff going on. Um, but those are all done now. And so I'm super, super excited to be entering into the space with you this morning and sharing from God's Word. And this year, you know, the season of Advent, we're working towards this idea of, of celebrating Jesus, but being unhurried, right? So celebrating Jesus, celebrating Christmas in an unhurried way. And I have to admit that when I posted this on our Facebook page and then shared it on my own Facebook page, uh, I had people writing in, uh, people who I know, people who are connected with the Salvation Army and work with the Salvation Army, who, you know, there was this kind of this scoffing of, yeah, right. And, uh, and so it just ignited a bit of conversation. And so, look, I have a confession that I need to make right at the onset of our time in the Word uh, together. And it's, it's a confession of a pastor, all right? All right? This week, I struggled significantly with this idea of celebrating Christmas in an unhurried way. Significantly, it was crazy and it was hard. And I had a few moments of complete overwhelm where the unhurried way felt beyond my grasp, where I sat in the car at one point in time and had a little cry because that's what uh, I needed to do. And there was this sense of here we are, you know, preaching this, sharing this, trying to live this, and uh, I definitely had a moment where I was like, I can't do what we've talked about doing. And uh, it was just this moment of, oh, just uh, complete overwhelm and feeling that reality of, of this is hard. This is definitely hard. And so after the tears, there was this significant moment of stopping, which we've talked about already. Um, because I had to, because I didn't want to get out of the car looking the way that I did, <laughs> of stopping. And there was this moment of resting, uh, because I needed to sit there for a few minutes. And this stopping and this resting gave way to a pause. And it was a pause where I experienced this, uh, this idea of invitation, that there was this invitation to a conversation with God. And friends, um, I, this is, I think, really the hard work of the soul. And this is the hard work of what we are trying to do together. And it is not easy. And so I just, I felt like I needed to say that um, today because, because we need to recognize that we are all in this together. And that, you know, Tim and I definitely, as your pastors, we do not have this all sorted. And we do not have this all worked out. That day was a hard day for me. And you know, I ended up uh, needing to kind of send a message to our team at the office and to our volunteers and say, hey, I know uh, I was not my best self today. And, and it's this recognition that we don't have this all figured out and that we are all in this together. And a lot of this is trial and error. And a lot of this is the deep soul searching, the deep hard work. But if we're going to change uh, the way that we love God and the way that we walk alongside in faith in this world, then the best way to do that is to do that together and recognize that it's hard, hard work. So I wanted to make sure that I said that today so that we can own this together. And so if you had a moment this week where you were overwhelmed and there was a bit of tears, then so did I. <laughs> if you had a moment this week where uh, maybe you looked at that unhurried image on your social media and you scoffed at it a little bit, then I would say, hey, we are all in this together. We don't have this all figured out. And so we need to walk it 
and we need to try to love it in the space that we're in. Um, and we need to try and figure out if that creates tension within us, then what is the invitation that God is inviting us to in these moments? So that is going to bring us into this space of where we've been and where we're going. And hopefully the moment that I had in the car recognizes uh, for us where we've been. There's been this stopping and there's been this resting. And last week, Pastor Tim identified a couple of things, a couple of challenges, a couple of practices that he wanted you to just kind of really dig into. Did you do that? If you didn't, we want you to jump on board with us. Um, so here were the three things that he just suggested. He suggested that this past week you were to identify some areas where you need to rest from your striving and learn more about trusting in him every day. Then the second thing was, think about a restorative niche. What does that look like? For you to have a restorative niche, any activity that provides rest and restoration for you, did you identify what that was? And did you participate in that this week? And then the third one, take a nap. Imagine that, imagine someone saying to you, okay, what you have to do this week is you need to take a nap. Did you do that? And did you think about how you felt before and how you felt afterwards? So we're actually going to pause and we're going to have a discussion about this. For those of you who are in neighborhood church, uh, just stop and have a discussion of how that worked for you this week. And just talk about if you didn't take some time to really kind of lean into those practices, then maybe the bigger question is why? And so let's delve into that. Let's hold each other accountable and let's talk about what that looked like for you this past week. Well, welcome back. And uh, this morning we're going to continue into the heart of the journey of Advent. And it's been a significant trip uh, of, of waiting, of waiting and figuring out like what it actually means for us to anticipate the fact that God chose to move into the neighborhood. I love that phrase from the message um, in John, John 1, 14, I believe it is, but where it says that God moved into the neighborhood and there's an anticipation around Advent with that. And so in an unhurried way, we have chosen as a church to stop and rest, which we've just talked about. And today we're going to experience the benefits, the benefits of a heart that has done the hard work of attentiveness into the heart of being in a place of delight. Now, before we get into that, we're just going to we're going to do a practice together, and Tim has done this with us the last couple of weeks, but it's the practice of silence and solitude. And so, so we're going to do that communally, corporately, all right? And so if you're in your neighborhood church, here we go. Two minutes of silence, right? And if you're just kind of watching, then I just invite you to join into two minutes of silence. Now, in our neighborhood church, we had a little bit of a discussion about the fact that our minds go in so many different directions when we sit in silence. So here is something that you can do. If you find your mind squirreling off uh, for two minutes, squirreling off in different directions, keep repeating in your space, come, Lord Jesus, come. And so when your thoughts go somewhere else, repeat that phrase, come, Lord Jesus, come. So here we go, two minutes of silence. There's gonna be a chime, and then I'm gonna invite you, uh, someone in neighborhood church, or if you're sitting and just listening, I'm going to invite you then to read Zephaniah 3, 14 to 20. So let's join in silence together and remember the phrase, come, Lord Jesus, come if you need to be drawn back in.
Well, welcome back. Welcome back into a space of growing and learning. And hopefully that gave you a moment of refreshment um, as you prepare to hear from God's word. Uh, look, for a gal that is just constantly on the move, silence and solitude is a significant challenge for me. And I've been doing it for now six, seven, eight months maybe. And what I've started to discover is that the more I do it, actually, the more I crave it. So if you find that hard, don't, uh, don't, get, uh, don't let that tension just be your reality. Uh, lean into the invitation that's there because you probably need it more than you think. So let's start talking about delighting delighting in the season of Christmas. Okay, that is a big word. Uh, delight. That is a big word. And I want you to take a moment to think about what you love most about the Christmas season. Okay? What you love most about the Christmas season. What are the things that bring you the most joy? The things that get you the most excited? That bring you the most delight? So I've thought about this very quickly for myself so that I can give an example. And here's probably one of the things that I love most about Christmas. We spend time as a family decorating our family tree. And it's usually always a real tree. And so this here is our family tree, okay? And it is a real tree. We make sure we have a real tree every year and on this family tree are decorations that are specific to uh, my children or that are have like specific memories that are attached to it and what I find is when we pull aside time and I would like to say that it was actually very difficult this year finding a night where we could do this and do this well um, but we stopped and we made sure we had that time and so we decorated this tree. And I just want to share with you some of the things that are on this tree that bring me the most delight. So we have decorations that my children have made. And we will often sit and we will remember what each of these ornaments actually mean to each and every one of us. And so this is a baby's first Christmas. And I believe that this one is for Isabella. And so we sit and we say, oh yeah. That was given to Isabella when, uh, when she was a baby and it was her first Christmas. This is one of Alex's decorations. And so Alex stops and he remembers the time that he was given this. And I must say that that, uh, that, that night, well, when we decorate this tree, that honestly brings the most delight to my space during Christmas because it helps us to stop and remember some significant memories for us as a family. And so this is our real family Christmas tree. And what's also very funny about this is this is the tree that I am not allowed to speak into about where the decorations go or how it looks or what happens. The kids get to decorate it to their full delight and mama gets to stay out of how it looks, all right? And so that's an important practice for me. Delight, what do you delight in? What do you delight in? And in all seriousness, is that a tricky question for you? Is it? Is that a hard question? What if we were to ask a child? What if we were to ask a child? Do you think it would be easier? I think it would be absolutely easier. And so when I think about delight, I think about my children, okay, especially when they were small. Now, I know that's cheesy, aww, but that's what I think about. And in all seriousness, the memories that I have of my kids growing up or even of myself as a kid, right, the sheer delight on Christmas morning, uh, the 4 a.m. wake-ups, I remember that and sending them back to bed. Then when it's time, the rushing down, uh, down the stairs to see the presents are up, the excitement, the anticipation, the joy bubbling up. That has been part of our story as a family. And it's the scene that maybe some of you can recall and can remember or even that you can remember about your own childhoods. And maybe it's not, maybe it's not your reality. Maybe it's not something that you specifically remember. But for kids on Christmas, it's the delight that we see in them, I think, that we really live through as we consider the Christmas season. 
I'd like to say today that these days it's not so much the case, right? My kids are getting older and it's a little bit different. The delight is different. It's changed. And that was, that's kind of what happens when we grow up, right? It shifts and it changes. But here's something else I think that's very interesting that we need to just consider together. It is actually harder for us today, I think, to delight. Why? Why does delight seem like such a foreign word? Well, if you've been with us uh, the last couple of weeks, and if you've been with us during our journey of the Sabbath trap practice with practicing the way, you might remember some of the conversations that we actually had around delight and Sabbath. And our neighborhood church actually leaned into this in a very specific way as we talked about the fact that in our culture of instantaneous joy and delight, the fact that we can order anything we want at any point in time, everything is at our fingertips. It is taken away from, uh, from this concept of deep delight. And we have actually lost the art of delighting. And I think that that is so true for us right now. And I actually think that our culture, our instantaneous culture has actually taken away from the Christmas magic that we all kind of long for a little bit on that Christmas morning. And so what if the magic of Christmas has a place in the God story of love pouring out in the wonder of the season? What if the childlike awe and wonder of Christmas is actually a spiritual rhythm that we need to lean into every single day of Advent? What if bringing an unhurried approach to the season creates a space, creates a space for delight, the kind of delight we thought that we've lost in our childhood? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> What if? Well, this morning I want to draw your attention to a particular verse in that passage that was read a little bit earlier in Zephaniah 3, where we find the word delight that I've just kind of shared about. And so I'm going to ask you to focus in on verse 17. If you have your Bible, open it up. Or if you've got your phone, you can open it up with me. And we're going to uh, just have a look at this verse together. For the Lord, it says, for the Lord your God is living among you. Sounds familiar? Uh, from John 14. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Now, these words remind us that the God that we serve, the Savior that we follow, He takes delight or He rejoices over us. Or in some translations, it says this, He is joyful over us, over you and over me. All these words are synonymous with each other, right? The scriptures convey over and over again that this is the case. True joy is revealed in Zephaniah. It is rooted in this unchanging love and salvation offered by our mighty God and by our merciful Savior. And in our humanity, we like to take that and place it to the side. And we often don't view God in that way. I don't view God in the fact that he actually delights in me. I struggle with that concept. It actually is something that is, is challenging for me to understand at the deepest parts of who I am. And I know that I'm not alone. We often, we often underestimate the joy that God has in his people. The joy that God has in you and in me. And so too often, we think that God is annoyed or God is irritated with us. Zephaniah, however, paints a beautiful and completely different picture of uh, what it means for God to be delighting in his people. 
And so our creator saves us. He rejoices over us and he does this with gladness. And I want to say to you this morning that God delights in you. He delights in you. He delights in you so much that when you end up in your car and you are uh, having moments of tears, <laughs> in that moment, he is delighting in you. And in that moment, he delighted in me. In the words of the great UK preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he says these things. Faulty as the church is, the Lord rejoices in her. While we mourn, as well we may, we do not sorrow as those without hope. For God does not sorrow. His heart is glad, and he is said to rejoice with joy. A highly empathetic uh, expression. So as we navigate this season, we must recognize that God's delight in us is not contingent upon our accomplishments and it's not contingent on our failures. Instead, it's actually anchored in his unconditional love for us, so much so that he became the God-man so that we could be reconciled and connected with him. And because of his great love, we can find that motivation and inspiration to delight in all the things, all the things that are good in this world, all the things that he brings to us that are to give us joy, that the giver of good gifts continues to give each and every one of us. And you know what? Throughout the Christmas narrative, there are, are lots of examples where there is delighting that's taking place in the story, right? Mary was delighted to be chosen to bear the Son of God. And her famous song in Luke 1, the Magnificent, came out of this delight. The shepherds were delighted to receive the angelic proclamation of the good news, so much so that they could not contain their praise about what they had heard and what they had seen. What about the wise men? They delighted so much in seeing the star and following that star and worshiping the newborn king that they came with gifts because they were delighted. What a beautiful thing. As I think back to my children, at an early age, enjoying Christmas morning as much as they did, I'm reminded of how Jesus in his teaching over and over emphasized the importance of a childlike faith. And I just want to say, here is where we intersect these two ideas. This idea of uh, the joy and the awe of Christmas magic. <laughs> And the joy and the awe of what happened for us on that Christmas morning that we are to just delight in. Dare I say that this concept of Christmas magic, this concept of delighting in Christmas is actually a spiritual discipline. It is actually really a spiritual rhythm and so that's how we are to embrace Christmas children approach life with wonder curiosity and unfiltered delight and I can't help but feel that this year God is calling me personally to experience his story in a way of a child with awe with delight and with wonder and uh, interestingly enough, we went to the Paul Baloche concert and one of the performers or one of the people who were leading worship, because it really was not a concert, it was, it was a worship experience, spoke of the fact that she was also being called to experiencing Christmas, not in a monotonous way of a story that we've always heard over and over and over, but as a child in delight. And I couldn't help but think to myself, she was speaking the words that I've been feeling this Christmas season. So today we are being invited into a space of reclaiming 
Christmas in childlike delight. The miraculous story of Jesus's birth and understanding it more fully in a way that lines up with the famous carol, Joy to the World. Let earth receive her King. What if we started fresh this Christmas and began approaching the manger in childlike awe and wonder? What if we rediscovered the joy in all its simplicity of God coming down and living among us? If you've done a kettle shift at Hillcrest, you'll see that our kettle is right next to this great big word, joy. And look, if you haven't seen it yet, sign up for a kettle shift and you can go and stand next to the word joy. <laughs> it's like a message to the world. And when we stand next to that word joy, wow, it's this moment of I'm proclaiming this not just by this big letters that are next to me, but by my presence and by the presence that I bring through God, his son. And so this Christmas time, we've got an opportunity here to lean heavily into joy. What if the magic of Christmas has a place in the God story that is pouring out a symphony of delight for each and every one of us? What if bringing an unhurried approach to the season creates space for delight for you? The kind of delight that we thought we had lost in childhood. That's the invitation and that's the challenge for us today and as we look into this next week together. So we have been uh, giving practices that we want you to think about and to do during this week. And I just want to say that if you are not taking time to reflect and to allowing God to kind of uh, connect in with your heart personally. I would challenge you this week to do that. We want you to do that and to allow the word to change you from the inside out. So here we go. Here are the three things that I want you to do this week. First of all, what gives you delight? And if you don't know that, I, I would just really challenge you to take some times this week some moment and really think about what brings you delight. Uh, I gave you one example for me, but here's a couple of more that I really delight in. And you know what? These don't have to be big things, but here's one thing that I delight in during the Christmas season. Cranberry Bliss Bars from Starbucks. Now listen, this isn't an advertisement for uh, these bars, but cranberry bliss bars, I delight in them over the Christmas season. Now, you can find the recipe and you can bake them and you can have them at home. And you know what? I decided actually not to do that because I want it to be a treat. I want it to be something that I delight in. And so that's an example. I, for those of you who know Tim and I well, you know that we delight in coffee. And so we lean into that in an exceptional way because it is something that we delight in. What do you delight in? Figure that out. The second thing I want you to do is this idea of pleasure stacking. So this coming week, we are a Sabbath observing church and we are doing that during Christmas. We are creating space for our staff to do that during Christmas. And that's really important. So when you take moments of Sabbath or a day of Sabbath, pleasure stack, Pick three things that you delight in and do those three things during this week or during that time of Sabbath. And lastly, I want you to lean into this idea of feasting. And, and here's my thinking behind this and practicing the way has helped me understand this in a very particular way. But Advent is about the season of waiting, right? There's this idea that we wait and in our culture, we do not know what it means to wait. Well, this week, I want you to wait. Wait in such a way that I want you to pick something that you delight in, something that you love. And it could be something that you participate in, in every day, I don't really know. But something that you delight in and pause with it through the week, wait. Wait and keep it for Christmas Day. So think about that in your own space. It's this idea of fasting and feasting, 
I am going to withhold this thing. I am going to wait through the week. I'm going to withhold it through the week and I'm going to be patient. And then on Christmas day, I am going to feast in a way that I've never feasted on this before so that uh, Christmas Day is something that brings me significant delight. All right, three things. Do you have them? The one, two, three. And a little bit later on today, you're going to get an email that's going to just kind of push you into that practice, invite you into that practice in a particular way, and we want you to engage. Uh, and so as we look into Christmas Day, that's what it's going to look like for us. So as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, let's not merely go through the motions of the season, but genuinely delight in the miracle of God. May this Christmas be a time of rediscovery, of joy in the Savior, a delight that surpasses circumstances and lasts beyond the season. Delighting in God's love, we find fulfillment, purpose, and the true essence of Christmas. And may the decorations and the carols let us discover the profound joy that comes from delighting in the true gift of Christmas, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you because you are a God who chooses to delight in us. And for, for some of us, that may be a concept that uh, is a little bit difficult for us to grasp. But God, this week, may we live in a place of delight. May we experience from you the delight that you have in us so that we're then able to allow that experience to be in the deepest parts of who we are. And may we be able to celebrate Christmas morning in a way that we never have before. Thank you, God, because you choose to delight in us. Thank you, God, because you bring us into your family where, where we can experience this idea of you moving into the neighborhood and walking alongside us. Thank you for your prophet Zephaniah and, and for the way that he just proclaims all that the, the Savior brings into our space. We are unlike, or we are, sorry, we are very much like the people that Zephaniah was speaking to. We are in the dark in many places. May we understand and know your light. And may we be able to delight in that light. Thank you, Jesus, for all you continue to do for us. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen.